Hello. Yes. Good morning. Good evening. Good, good morning. afternoon. <laughs> yeah. Good evening from Dubai. Good morning from Canada. And um, from where we have the guest of honor today. We have a very special guest from Denmark. A Not passionate a wildlife, place. passionate wildlife photographer. His journey into wildlife photography began in your place actually where you are now beautiful oh, okay. british columbia yeah uh so he, he was living there and he worked there for several years and he moved back to denmark uh, last year mm -hmm. so let's not waste more time let's welcome michael hello <laughs> hello hello thank you so much for having me i'm uh it's an honor to be on. Thank you for uh, for reaching out. I appreciate it. It's our pleasure, Thank Mike. Thank you for awesome. coming. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I was looking forward to it. And it's so funny, Nisha. You're in uh, you're in Vancouver now. That's where I used to live. <laughs> so I, it's my loss. You moved from here to there. Otherwise, at least I had some company over here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's uh, I'm I'm, uh, I'm I'm jealous. Uh, it's it's such a beautiful place. Uh, you know, the whole Lower Mainland, and that's where. That's where my passion for wildlife photography started. Uh, yeah, it's just an incredible place. There's so much beautiful nature and so many cool species to photograph and just so much space to explore. Yeah. And that's that's the contrast now that I'm back in Denmark because Denmark is, you know, a tiny, tiny, tiny country and there's it's completely flat. There's no mountains or anything. How, how do you see the difference in photography? Uh, well, for me, it's... Um, I think the, the the big difference is just the uh, the lack of wilderness, you could say, because you know in Canada it's just such a huge country, and there's so much. Uh, uh, I think it's called Crown Land, where you know uh, where the public can access, and you can you can drive for hours and hours and days. You know, if in Denmark, if you drive for you know five hours, either you're going to be in the middle of the ocean or you're going to be in a different country. So, <laughs> so you don't really have that sense of of wilderness, and I I miss that. I miss having that feeling of really being away from everything. But then on the other hand, in Denmark, there's uh, there's a lot of different, a lot of variation, and because the country is so small, you can you can go a lot of interesting places in in a very short amount of time. Where in Canada, you'd have to plan like a, you know an eight hour drive or something. In here, you know, within like three hours you can you can go to so many different places and then in some ways in denmark it's because there's there's people everywhere it, it it's a bit more crowded but on the other hand in canada especially in the lower uh, in in bc everyone is out in nature you know everyone who lives there is an outdoor enthusiast yeah. and all the tourists and stuff so sometimes in, in canada i get frustrated because it's like i can't believe it like i thought i was alone and then all of a sudden you know you have all these people around you and dogs and pickup trucks and stuff so it's, it's kind of weird in that way. In some ways, in Denmark, I get more nature time alone because there's just less people out there. So it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, it's a trade-off. In, in, in some ways, it's, it's uh, I guess it's, it's exciting and, and better. And in some ways, it's, it's not. Uh, yeah, in some ways, it's, it's much worse <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> and then also, we don't, we don't, in Denmark, we don't really have, we don't really have megafauna in the same way. Uh, Oh, we, we do. We don't we don't have, uh, you know, big predators. Um, there are some wolves in Denmark with that came back within the last like five years or so. But other than that, I think badgers are like the biggest predators we have. So what, where I lived in uh, in B.C., I lived over on the Sunshine Coast and we had black bears in the, in the backyard, you know, and you'd oh. see cougars and stuff. That's not the case here. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's less that. exotic. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so do we start with the presentation? Yes, I'd love to. So uh, yeah, I, uh, I'll share my screen. And I thought, um, I thought I'd, I'd try to combine some of the uh, uh, kind of tips and stuff, combine that a little yep. bit with, with a bit of my own story. So what I thought I could do is I would... Uh, go through some of like the biggest kind of aha moments I, I would call them I've had in my uh, own wildlife photography journey kind of milestones or things where I felt like I've kind of 
you know, got unlock the next level or whatever. And things I think are important. And then we can talk about some some tips in that too. And then other, after that, I have some. I can show some photos and maybe tell some stories or something. Um, so I'll just uh, share my screen here one second. Yeah. And I so the different aha moments I have. I thought I would divide them into. Can you see? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I thought I'd divide them into kind of things that have to do with gear first. We we can cover that pretty quickly, and I think that's the least interesting part of it. And then uh, I'll cover aha moments that really have very little to do with gear, but everything to do with, with photography. So all the, the, th the stuff I think is, is probably more important. But um, I think one of the, if we stick to gear, I think one of the, the my big leaps forward was when I got my first kind of semi-pro DSLR camera, um, uh, the Nikon D500. That really uh, helped me a lot because all of a sudden, you know, I had better image quality, you know, uh, better uh, low light capabilities, much faster focusing and uh, bigger files and, you know, all that good stuff, uh, higher frame rate and so on. And I, that I really felt a difference there. And there's always the discussion, I think of the age old discussion of whether it's, it's, is gear, how, how important is gear? You know, is it the photographer? Is it the gear? And I, I totally agree that it's mainly the photographer. And that a good photographer can make awesome images with more or less any gear but gear still plays a, a huge role i think because it gives you that advantage or it, it just makes it easier for you to do the stuff you like to do um so that was that was a big one for me and another one was when i got my first f4 prime lens oh man i spent a long time uh, well, I guess for for a long time I thought it was completely insane to spend that kind of money on camera gear. <laughs> but then, the more I got into it, the more I, I wanted it, and the more I could kind of see the advantages. And um, and then I, I I saved up money and I I bought a, a used. It was the older version, the the Nikon 500 millimeter G uh, version. Yeah. I got a good deal on that one. I, I sold a bunch. I I sold my guitar gear <laughs> to finance it. <laughs> And then, uh, and that was a big leap forward too, I think, because just the the image quality, you know, you get from from a lens like that was a big one for me. And then just going from shooting like uh, I, I I was shooting the Sigma one hundred and fifty to six hundred, so mainly shooting at six point three f six point three, then being able to shoot at f four, you know, the extra light it gives you and that the opportunity to shoot at higher shutter. As, uh, uh, shutter speeds and stuff that was a big one and also just the uh, uh, the focusing capabilities and all that stuff uh, i remember being really kind of uh, concerned that i would miss uh, the zoom uh, i don't I, I never really miss zoom anymore so that was a, definitely a, a good trade-off and that was one thing that really also made me take like a big leap forward i think yeah. uh, obviously it was much 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 more heavy so I had to kind of come to terms with the fact that this thing was a, a tank I was carrying around all of a sudden. But, you know, you get used to that. So I started using a, uh, a monopod much more, uh, you know, and, and doing a bit less uh, hand-holding. Uh -huh. And then I think also when I got my first full-frame camera, that was, in a, that was a D850. That was a big one. I, it took me a long time to understand and I think also appreciate, uh, you know, for example, um, the image quality of a full frame camera, the capabilities, because I my logic was I do wildlife photography, so I want to get close. So a crop sensor is fine. I, that's preferable. But then I, I kind of came around and when I got the D850 and started shooting with it, I could really see, like, for example, uh, low light capabilities compared to what I had before. And, you know, also just the image quality and so on. It was just, um, I think, uh, for me, also a big leap forward and also a point in my own development, I think, where I started um, appreciating other things than getting close. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, I think I, I love close ups and everything, but I, I think that's maybe a natural thing for, for a lot of us. I think it's maybe also almost a cliche for me to mention it, but I think in the beginning, you're very fascinated with getting as close as possible to the subject. And then I think 
for a lot of us, it's a natural progression that you then get start get more interesting in, in getting a bit more environment and just, you know, composition and everything. And there's not a ton of composition in, in getting really close. So that, that was a big one for me. And I would say my first mirrorless, the Z6. And I have the Z6 II now, and now obviously there's the Z9, which looks incredible. So I have to save up money for that thing. But the, the, and there, there was a lot of, of faults, I think, or things that could have been better, especially with the first the Z6. But the, the, the big game changer for me with that one was being able to see the true exposure, you know, in real time, seeing it through the viewfinder. That yeah. was a big one for me because it just helped me so much in being able to just focus on, on the composition and, and exposure and getting everything just right uh, on the spot, you know. With with the DSLR, it's you know it's basically just a hole in the camera, and, and you don't really know what you're doing until you look, you know, at the back of the camera or the histogram or something. So there's always that lag, and then when you get really excited or things are going fast, then you don't necessarily know that you messed up, you know, your exposure or whatever it could be. And then you look at the photos afterwards, you're like, oh no, I can't believe it. And with the mirrorless, I find like that, I find that doesn't really happen because you always know. What your exposure is when you're looking at it so that was a big one for me and then also um a lot of the photography i've done has been with shy species so being able to just lie there and do everything in camera and you know uh, the the silent shutter and everything that just helped me uh, be able to do a lot of photography that i felt like i couldn't do with uh, with the dslr so that was a big one for me and then i think also kind of understanding editing software better um its limitations and you know what you can and can't do with it and and also just uh small things like you know masking or dodging and burning you know making small corrections like that i i don't do it i don't i'm not heavy on editing i i try to keep it as natural as possible and i try to get it as good as possible um in camera but i still think that editing is extremely important and i also think understanding editing software and how how to use it correctly uh, gives you some opportunities also like if you're shooting I've, I've gotten into shooting a lot of backlit and and then kind of knowing that if I way underexpose then I can correct that in post so I kind of I'm shooting something uh, that looks different than what I know it's going to end up looking like and not in the sense that you're going out of your way to really change it, but you just know that you can kind of take it somewhere else in, in the software. Sorry, I cut you off. No, no, no. Um, and I think that's an interesting one. For, for me, it's, um, yeah, the editing is really important and, and it's, uh, it's a big part of what I do. And I, 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 I think it's really um, fun also that creative process. But I, I kind of think of it, what I do, I think, is very comparable to what you used to do in the dark room, you know, with, with film, in the sense of just, you know, changing the exposure and stuff like that. I, I don't do a lot of uh, removing things, um, uh, and also I would, I guess I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty firm in the sense that I don't, I don't personally think that with wildlife stuff you should, you know, use software to change, this, you know. Your, the background you know put in a completely different background and stuff like that that's that's yeah. just taking it way too far and you know and it, people can do what they want and so on i i, I don't want to tell people what's doing or not but to me at least <laughs> they, they big... call it the artistic right yeah exactly 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 but to, <laughs> to me at least my my philosophy is that there's so much beauty and art in nature already and I'd like to try and capture that and show it in, in, a, in a pretty natural way because that's what I want to show other people is what I see out there. I don't want to show them uh, some kind of a collage of a sky I shot on Sunday and then an animal I shot on Wednesday and putting that together. That to me is just not particularly <laughs> interesting. I think there is an aspect of, of um, document documentation in it along with the whole artistic part, but that's that's the way I feel. Yeah. That's a that's a big discussion, a controversial one. <laughs> but and I guess another thing is also it's to me also a big part of, of the of wildlife photography is that it is so difficult. You know, I mean, all photography I think is difficult in landscapes too. But when you do wildlife photography, everything kind of has to come together. You know, 
and you can't control wildlife. So obviously, if you're shooting a mountain or something, you need the right light and the right sky and everything. But it's not like you're going to show up, uh, you know, you go scouting on Sunday and you show up on Wednesday and then the mountain is gone. You know, <laughs> it's it, you can plan a little bit more. And with wildlife, you have that completely uncontrollable element. And so I think part of it is is putting in all that time to get naturally that incredible scene. And to me, then it takes away from that if you do that by putting in different yeah. elements. It just, it, for me, it, it, it ruins it for me anyways. <laughs> and then yeah. to the stuff that I, sorry? No, no, I said it, that, that's what even I feel. Yeah. I think so. I think that, yeah, it's, it's, that's a big part of the fun also, I think, and the fascination with it is, is putting in all that time, you know, to capture that incredible moment. And that's also, that's also more fun because then you're experiencing that moment, you know, you're seeing it, you're like, oh, I can't believe this is happening in front of me. And then as far as the stuff that's maybe more interesting, I think, is, 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 is all the skills and all the things you have to learn that, that don't have to do with gear. So uh, I think the first thing that was that the first big aha moment I had was with, with the very first little DSLR I had, I bought like a D3300 and I had a little kit lens and um, I got it a couple of years after we moved to, uh, to British Columbia because every, there was just so much beauty everywhere and, and I, I started using my, my cell phone and then I wanted to try to have a camera. And I started just photographing everything, you know, anything like a flower, a building, a person, bah. And uh, and then I found out, you know, when I came home and put it on the computer, I was like, oh, that that looks horrible, you know. And it, so I found out that um, <laughs> that just because it looks nice when you look at it, it doesn't mean you can take a photo of it. So I think that was a big one for me. I was like, okay, okay, okay. So okay, I have to learn kind of to see what can become a photo and, and what can't. So that was that was kind of the first thing, I think, for me. Uh, then naturally through that kind of process of trying to photograph everything, uh, I kind of moved over. I, I lost interest in, in, in taking photos of things that uh, humans have, have made, you know, or man-made things or things that humans um, have a role in, basically. So I started focusing on just uh, um, uh landscapes and stuff and 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 animals and then naturally it just wildlife was just the thing that caught my attention and i just kind of i lost folk or i i lost interest in in everything else basically and so that was a big one for me because then i started really focusing and dedicating time to wildlife and what you know going down that that uh, rabbit hole and i think um Obviously, it's 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 fun. I, I see a lot of wildlife photographers who are really good at at, at uh, landscapes and so on, and that that's fantastic. But for me, I think that focus was was a, was important in the sense that I could really dedicate a lot of time to wildlife, and and wildlife, anyways, is is, is such a, a, a wide uh, you know subject matter, anyways. So there's so much variation there. And this one was really, really, really important. And this it might be kind of a controversial topic in some ways, and people might get angry at me for saying it. But one of the, the most important things I, I think I learned was being critical of myself. I think for me, and it might be the same for other photographers, but I think at the beginning, when you get you know, a telephoto lens and stuff, and you start taking photos, then you're just blown away by your own stuff. Like you're like, oh my God, like, you know, I remember the first time I took a bit of photo of a bald eagle I was like oh, it doesn't get better than this this is absolutely incredible <laughs> it wasn't of course it was so basic and horrible photo but to me it was amazing and then one of my friends uh, who who had had more experience at, in photography I showed him some of my stuff and 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 he liked some of it but he was also really honest with me and he was like but this is that photo is not in focus and I'd be like but it's an owl and he's like it doesn't matter man it's it's not it's not sharp you know it doesn't work and i'd be like um uh or like uh you know that photo is is, is the, the exposure is horrible on it it looks it looks bad you know the colors are off and stuff or you know and i'd be like yeah but but it's an eagle it's an eagle flying can't you see that and he'd be like but it doesn't matter michael because it's it's not a good photo 
And I'm I'm so great. It was it was maybe a little bit hard to hear at first, but I was so great. I'm so grateful looking back that I learned that early on because it taught me to uh, be more humble with my own stuff, and then also spend time being critical rather than just looking for excuses why my own photo is like the best thing ever. It taught me to kind of focus on what could be better, how I could improve, and what wasn't so good about the photo. And I, I think that's really important. So. I think you have to be a bit hard on yourself if you if you really want to develop and, and progress and also getting uh, being open to criticism from other people, you know, showing your stuff to folks and getting honest uh, feedback. You know, some some people are blown away by any photo of an animal. And to me, that's not particularly helpful. I'd rather seek out the people who can say, like, yeah, you know what, actually, if that branch wasn't there, it'd be better. Or I think you should do this or that. Um, so I, I think that's really important. And then. Yeah. And I think there might be a tendency among photographers to kind of go the other way, make excuses for why it's actually a good photo. Uh, to me, it, it, the other thing is more interesting, at least if you want to, uh, I think, have a, you know, a good progression and, and constantly challenge yourself and become better. And obviously that's different for everyone. But for me, it's, that's important. I, I, I'm, my personality type is that I, I like to learn new stuff. I like to progress. I like to, to get better at things. And so, uh, I like the the idea of being a student of photography for forever. I don't think I'll I'll ever have learned everything or be as good as I can get. I th I think and I think that's a beautiful thing because it's that means I can keep doing this forever and still you know learn and and evolve, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, I think that's really important. And then another thing I think that was really, really important was kind of learning about wildlife and habitat and, and approaching wildlife, being around wildlife uh, for many different reasons. I think uh, in the beginning, I <laughs> because I didn't know anything, I was like, oh, well, I, I love to photograph an owl. And then I just go, you know, all kinds of random places looking for owls, which, you know, obviously going to waste a ton of time doing that because, you know, it makes sense that if there's a specific subject you want to photograph, you need to know where to look, you know, and understand its behavior and stuff. It increases your chances quite a lot. And I think in the beginning for me, it was exciting just to go anywhere where there was nature and just see what I could see. But once I started really learning about nature and wildlife and habitat and everything, that, that was also a, a, a big aha moment and a big step forward because then obviously, you know, uh, you, you increase your chances of success. And uh, it, that's also a very exciting part of it, I think, because um, I feel like uh, once I got into wildlife photography, I, I started, I, I, I got this new part of, I unlocked a new part of my brain and I got new eyes that I didn't have before because all the start, of a sudden I started seeing all this stuff, you know, all these animals everywhere and birds and, you know, all these incredible things going on. It was like the secret world that was obviously always there. I just, I just didn't know about it. And to me, that was just fascinating. And also, I had no idea, like, for example, with, with birds, just how complex uh, beings they are and, you know, social structures and how they live their lives and everything. So it was just such a beautiful part uh, of the natural world I just didn't know about. So that in itself, I think, is incredible. Um, and also, I, I'm, I'm a little bit jealous of people who started out being birders and then got into photography because they have such a huge advantage because they just know so much and i started the other way around so i had to i had to learn all the other stuff um and then obviously i think the you know the whole thing about learning how to approach wildlife and that also means you know sometimes keeping your distance and stuff and really learning to understand the signs that the animals are showing you and stuff as far as not harassing them or you know, kind of being, yeah. being, a, being, you know, uh, a nasty person out in nature, if you could say that, you know, learning a little bit about the ethics and so on and knowing when to back off. I, I think that's important, especially because there's so many photographers now and there's more and more people going out there with cameras. It, uh, I think it's really important that everyone spends more time trying to learn this stuff. Um, you know, you hear so many terrible stories about, uh, you know, especially with owls where they have to, you know, where they 
die or they have to leave the area or something like that or it gets super stressed out because everybody wants a photo so i i think that aspect is really important and uh, there have been definitely been situations where I've, I've selected selected to stay away, even if there was a subject I wanted to, to photograph and um, I knew it was close by, but I knew also that there'd be like 60 photographers there. So uh, I didn't want to be part of that because I, I thought it would it would kind of ethically not make sense. Um, and also it's, it's just to me, I, I like most of my photography I do alone because it's about being out in nature alone and getting away from everything. So it almost defeats the purpose if I'm standing there with 60 photographers. I mean, I've, I've, I've been in those situations too, but as, as far as possible, I try to, to avoid them because another thing is that then everybody gets the same photo and that's, you know, just not the same thing. You don't really get that that nature experience if all you can hear is like -ta 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 -ta. You know, everybody else's shot is going off in the background <laughs> machine gun fire and then this one i think is really important so you could say that this is related to gear but it's really about you know the opposite and uh, so i think that one was being able to free myself from my gear so that to me that meant getting to the point where i knew my gear well enough that i wasn't standing there like oh, oh you know kind of like oh i wonder what setting i should use or you know being so focused on just getting the photo that i couldn't really focus on anything else once i got to the point where it became kind of second nature everything and i set up custom, my custom settings and i got really comfortable with my gear that was a huge one because that meant that all of a sudden i could focus more on what was out there you know uh, composition and behavior and all that kind of stuff i remember for the first couple of years I was often surprised when I came home and saw my photos, like, wow, like, I can't believe I couldn't see, you know, all that stuff in the background, you know, that stick in the background or whatever. I, that still happens, but in the beginning, it happened a lot. So once I could kind of free myself from that and start spending more time uh, actually planning what I wanted to shoot and so on, that was a big, 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 big um, leap for me. So that's also one of the, I think, one of the really important tips, tips I would say to uh, anyone else or anyone who's starting with, with photography in general, not just wildlife photography, is that, uh, yeah, practice and practice and practice to the point where it becomes second nature. And maybe some of that means uh, just limiting the options you have. Like one of the things I, I do with my custom settings is just limit uh, the amount of different, uh, you know, um, uh, out of out of focus uh, what's it called uh, uh, options that's not the right word i can't remember what it's called right now but you know uh, the different af settings and stuff to just what i need and i basically just need to one that's you know basically pinpoint and one that's a bit you know wider for stuff that moves um uh, yeah so that one was really important <laughs> this one i for me was a huge one and one I'm still dealing with. And I think it's such an interesting topic. And I think I imagine that all wildlife, wildlife photographers kind of deal with this and struggle with it from time to time. For me, it was a big one. I'm, uh, I'm very much uh, <laughs> driven by excitement, things that a typical kind of ADHD person, like things that I'm interested in, I'm super focused and interested in and things I'm not interested in. I, I'm, you know, I'm not interested. In. Um, and so I also get really, really excited. And in the beginning, I would get so frustrated because I'd be dreaming of all these things, you know, that was going to happen when I go out tomorrow. And, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd oh, I'm going to find this owl or whatever, or something. I'm going to get this amazing photo. And then when things didn't pan out the way I planned, which they rarely do, I would get so frustrated. I get angry. And, you know, I go through periods, you know, maybe of months when just nothing works out. You know, and then I go through periods where things work out, but you have those dry spells, I think. And it was almost ruining photography for me because I got emotional about it, you know, frustrated and, and that could kind of take over. And I, at one point I was like, this is kind of crazy because the whole idea of doing this is, is the opposite is to get out there and be happy, you know, and, and not be stressed and not be frustrated. So I think a big part of it for me was just learning the whole patience thing. Um, uh, so, you know, just kind of uh, accepting that I'm going to spend a lot of time out there just waiting. And that's just part of it. And 
for for the and just kind of accepting that there's like a million things that can go wrong and I, I can't predict any of it and also I can't control nature and I can't control wildlife I just can't so kind of accepting that it's beyond my control and then just enjoying being out there like telling myself hey this is incredible you get to spend three hours out in nature that's amazing no matter what happens and then also yeah, just accepting the fact that some things are out of control and that it's it's pointless to be frustrated about it. And then also just knowing that at some point it's probably going to happen, that thing I've been trying to, I've been building up towards. And when it happens, it's just going to be even better and feel amazing. But I think that one is really, really important um, for me, at least. Uh, I know there's people out there I've talked to who are like, ah, that's not a big thing for me which to me is mind blowing. I don't, I don't understand that. <laughs> I think that's amazing if you can have that kind of personality. I don't know, is that something for you guys? Do you, do you, do you, do you is that something you, 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 do you know that feeling of, of, of you know, frustration or disappointment? Oh, definitely. I mean, it's a part of most of us, right? You know, yeah. especially in the beginning days when you start, yeah. you, you have expectations and uh, you dream of things. And when it doesn't happen, then it's quite naturally you get into a feel whether you're doing the right thing or it's just you. Sometimes you get into a feel why it's just me all the time. Why am I getting to see all these great photos from all other people? And yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, especially when you see everyone else posting stuff that's amazing. You're like, ah! Yeah, that's true. That's true. But also, I think another thing also, I guess, is when you when you kind of uh, develop as a photographer, you also start having higher standards, I think, because I was, at one point, I was, I was thinking like, man, like, I used to get so many great photos and stuff, and I can't, am I just getting worse? But actually, it's because I was getting better, and I just had higher and higher standards. So in the beginning, like, you know, there's, it didn't take much for me to be like, oh, my God, this was incredible. And now it takes a lot more because now it's, you know, yeah. like lately I've been trying to, you know, my list is, is very long. It's like, okay, I have to get out there with exactly the right, uh, the right light, exactly the right background, exactly the right perch, exactly the right bird, exactly the right backlight. And I want the breath and, you know, so it's, <laughs> you know making it increasingly difficult. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of psychology that goes into that. Um, I think one, just one quick story I could share is uh, I wanted to, um, uh, there's, uh, I've been following, I think, four different badger dens here in Denmark. Uh, I had my, uh, over the winter and, and spring, and I was waiting for the days to be long enough, you know, that I could actually photograph them in light. And none of them worked out for, for various different reasons, which was super disappointing and frustrating but one of them i uh, it's my father has uh, a couple of acres and uh, of, of, of a forest and there was an active badger in there it's close to some fields with with cattle and i'd set up uh, um, uh, trail cameras i've been i've been uh, you know uh, 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 documenting it for a while and i knew the badger was there it was active and it was actually one one uh, one den where there was a nice background and it was just it was uh, everything was basically perfect there and i'd i'd been there and i'd set up like a little uh, a little uh, post you know where i could sit that was a little bit off it, it was it was kind of a slant so i could, i had to set up in a tree so i could be eye level and i, I spent so much time setting it up and then the day i was going to go there I, I had all my camouflage on and I, I, you know, I used all the set removal stuff, blah, 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 blah. I show up and then I had a ca uh, two wild, uh, two trail cameras up there and I was going to check them just to see like what the badgers had been doing lately. And then when I came out there, I noticed one of them that was, had been sitting in a little like tiny tree, uh, the tree had been knocked over. I was like, oh, that's weird. Uh, hmm. And then um, when I checked the cameras, there was like hundreds of videos on there. I thought, oh, the badgers have been really active. No, 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 that was not the case. It was just cattle. It's just cows. So there had been like 30 cows there for a couple of days, just stomping around the badger den. And I had like hundreds of videos of these cows, like you just poking their heads into the den and, you know, digging and stuff. I don't know. I, I think they hate the badgers or something. So anyways, the badgers were long gone because they weren't having that. So all the energy and stuff I put into it was, was just completely wasted. There were no badges there anymore. And at that point, I, I just kind of had to laugh at the situation because I was like, of all the things I could imagine that could have gone wrong, 
cows invading <laughs> invading the badger den was was I could never have imagined that happening. So you know, it's just so unpredictable. And I think at some point you just kind of have to laugh at it and be like, oh well, okay, well, I'll just try again. Yeah, just with a laugh. Yeah, exactly. And just like you know, just make a little bit of fun of yourself and just kind of, well, that's that's a good story for later. I can tell. And then uh, another one was just kind of experimenting and, and getting more creative. Um, and that's different for everyone. And I think uh, I think a lot of people who are just really in, who are like super, super hardcore bird nerds, for example, just get it, just getting a documentation shot is amazing. And that that's fantastic. More power to you. Uh, you know, that's that's awesome. To, to me, I, I like uh, I like the whole kind of creative process and just becoming a bit more artistic and stuff. And so that's just kind of naturally been my development and what I kind of personally find to be really interesting is just experimenting, trying new things, getting more creative. And, um, and I think, you know, maybe a couple of years ago, if I heard someone say what I'm saying now, you know, about, you know, maybe doing some small in frame or backlit and all that stuff, I would have been like, you know, you know, animals are awesome, just get the photo kind of thing. But now a couple of years later, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm saying the same thing. So part, part of it for me is, 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 is constantly evolving. And, and part of that is trying new things. So for example, I've started experimenting with uh, camera trapping now, which is super difficult. It's a completely different kind of photography. Uh, there's so much to learn there. I've, I haven't gotten a single decent photo yet. Now, a couple of months later, like mainly just cats, house cats running around and stuff or blurry photos of a, of a fox or something. Um, or uh, I, the summer I built a, a floating hide, just, you know, built it out of some uh, tubes and stuff. I started experimenting with that, which was really funny that were really fun and exciting and a, and a completely different angle and, uh, you know, um, experimenting much more with, with backlit, experimenting much more with uh, short, you know, wide angle lenses and stuff. To me, that's part of it. It's just really fun is, 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 is trying all that different stuff. And in that way, you know, seeing uh, if I can push myself creatively and artistically to, 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 to always um, move forward and so on and not just kind of get stuck doing one thing. Of, of course, there's something to be said for specializing in one specific thing. I, I respect that a lot. But on the other hand, I also think it's, it's really fun to go off on a different, a lot of different directions and then kind of figure out what, uh, you know, what really gets your attention. So, uh, for example, started doing a bit of macro photography, you know, kind of shooting some in, uh, insects and stuff like that. I think that's, that's a very um uh fun part of the whole thing yeah, the toughest then, which i find is macro what, what was that sorry the toughest i find is macro yes it is it is really uh it is, is it is really difficult i find the thing that surprised me though with with macro is that uh, it's, it's a surprise that how similar it is to shooting birds or mammals in this in in the sense that, that you're yeah. you're still focusing you know, on, the, uh, on on composition and background and light and all that stuff. But it's so difficult because it's it's on that tiny, tiny level. Uh, just getting the focus right is, is, is insanely hard. Uh, finding insects and stuff. I think one of the things that's really interesting about macro, though, is that it's um, you get even more focused. Because yes. one of the things I, I like about wildlife photography in general is, is that you kind of uh, you hone in and a lot of the, the rest of the world disappears and you have to slow down. But with insects, you have to slow way down, you know, because you're like, you're basically this close, you know, you're crawling around in the grass and stuff. So it really, really, uh, you know, becomes this kind of meditative state. I, I think that's quite interesting. Yeah. And <laughs> have you done a lot of macro? Close is so difficult. You know, the moment you put one step, 99.9% .9 of the time, the subject is gone. Yes, 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 definitely. Have you done a lot of uh, macro? No, I'm trying. I got it. I mean, macro is completely new rather than in the beginning we used to. But uh, late, I mean, recently I got a 100mm macro lens. So I'm trying to get one step 
closer to the subject and the subject is like data bye bye to me <laughs> yeah i know i know I, I, th I thought it would be easier with insects i thought they'd just sit there but i was uh, i learned that too it's like oh my god yeah these things no no they're not just going to sit there and also they're so fast you know like with spiders and stuff you know they're and also fast they're and so difficult to sport it's crazy yeah totally and also because the uh what's it called the 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 the, the focus area what's it called the the depth of field is so shallow yeah, yeah. that just like one millimeter and then it's not sharp anymore that yeah it's it's, it's difficult it definitely is yeah uh, i feel this yeah and then i think this one also was a, was a big one for me it's kind of like focusing more on on this uh, everything else in the scene rather than just the animal itself which kind of goes back to the experiment uh, experimenting and getting creative and so on is and i think that's that's uh, also a preference things, a style thing, but, you know, kind of going back to the whole thing of, of starting with wanting to go as close as possible and then actually kind of going wider and discovering like, hey, it's actually, there's a lot of art and there's a lot of beauty and a lot of interesting uh, aspects to, you know, not filling the frame with just the, 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 you know, the bird or whatever it is and actually getting all that other stuff. And then you have kind of like that combination of a bit of landscape and the subject. Um, I, I, yeah, that to me is, has become increasingly interesting. And again, like when, if I heard someone talk about that a couple of years ago, I'd be like, mm, 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 you know, arty farty or whatever. But but now I'm I'm kind of doing the same thing myself. I think uh, if you can get, and it's also really hard. I it, I'm surprised at how difficult it is, it is actually to make something beautiful and interesting where you, you know the subject is, is is small in frame. So I think yeah. That, that, that part to me anyways is, uh, has really made uh, the whole thing much more interesting and fun for me and it's bigger, been a big kind of aha moment. <laughs> yeah, so that was kind of me trying to do a combination of, of like my own journey and also uh, some tips and stuff. So should we, um, I know we've been yeah, going for a while now, do you wanna do you wanna wrap up or do you wanna look at some photos? Yeah, we would love, definitely love to look at some photos for sure. Cool. I'll uh, I'll just find, share my Lightroom. Can you see my Lightroom, Catalaka? Yes. Yes. All right, so yeah, so I guess I'll start with uh, the shortier owl here. Is it big enough? Does it? Uh, yeah, it, but uh, can we make it full screen? Is there a possibility? Yeah, uh, yes, like that. Yep. Uh, so yeah, yeah so so. Um, yeah, you probably know because you're in Vancouver now. There's, you know, there's some really good spots out there in, in the lower mainland for uh, for the shorties, for the shorty owls in winter. And so they'll always have a, a special place in my heart, I think, because they were uh, one of the first subjects, really exciting subjects I got to spend a lot of time with. And, you know, you kind of, in some ways, you, you you can get spoiled, spoiled as a photographer in British Columbia because there are really some amazing opportunities. Shorty owls are one of them. And so I just spent so much time shooting uh, short girls. They're just such cool, amazing looking birds. And this photo to me will always be special because it was, uh, it was one of those days where I got up really early and went out there. I lived quite far away from this spot. So, and I didn't have a car at this point. So I spent like a ton of money on cabs and stuff to get out there. And uh, I've been looking at the, uh, the, 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 the weather forecast. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to be sunny and beautiful and it was just completely foggy and so i was i was kind of angry and frustrated because like ah i spent all this time uh, all this planning and it's just going to be a horrible day but then actually some of the shots i got turned out to be some of my favorite ones because it was like really uh, kind of gloomy and, and moody uh, you know weather so this one will always be special to me and one of the things i like here is just like you really got the the thing Ice. going with the yeah, the black around the eyes. It's, it looks like black makeup, like you know, kind of <laughs> goth, goth stuff. And then uh, I think uh, any owl 
that has yellow eyes is just amazing. It's just it's just yeah. such a it's such a crazy feature. Yeah, it grabs all your attention. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, th this one here is also gonna always gonna be special because it was the first <laughs> it was the first pig meow I, I shot. I really miss pig meows now that I'm not in Canada anymore because. I was also one of the subjects I spent a long time photographing and a long time looking for. And um, we we moved when we moved out of Vancouver over to the Sunshine Coast. I had them in my area, so I spent just so many hours and days looking for them. But but this guy was the first one, and this was also while I was living in downtown Vancouver and didn't have a car. So I spent yeah stupid amounts of money on on cabs and stuff to get a, to get to different spots. And this one was. Uh, what was it maplewood flats i think it's called um <clears throat> and i knew that there was a pygmy owl out there i'd seen that on, on ebird and also just on facebook but every time i went there there was no pygmy owl it was i like i think i went there five times and every time it was like no no he was here yesterday <laughs> no we haven't seen him today for example and it was just i was losing my mind it was like this is just insane and then finally i think the sixth time i went out there uh the owl was there and it, uh, all of a sudden it pulled out like you know this uh, this bowl that it had stashed and uh sort of started eating it in front of me which was just mind-blowing so that will that will always be a special experience for me the first the very first pig meow and i remember just being completely blown away by how small they were i knew they were small but actually seeing how small these little guys are this, that was just phew, incredible to me and also just how brutal they are just tiny killing machines um this photo will also always be special to me because I. Wow. Another thing I, I I miss a lot from Canada are the hummingbirds, and um, just such amazing creatures. And it's, you know, you, you normally connotations with hummingbirds are like summer and flowers and stuff. So, it's amazing how they survive through winter. Uh, you know, they they eat, um, they they get the sap from the trees and stuff, and it's. And it's just amazing they can survive. And so uh, there was this one, this was right like within the first, uh, I think, six months of us moving to the Sunshine Coast. There was like a, a, a cold uh, spell uh, in the lower mainland. So there's quite a lot of snow. It got really cold. And this one female, Anna's Hummingbird, was hanging out just outside the building we lived in. And I saw her every day. And I, I just it was so crazy with all the snow and stuff. So I went out there. I got some photos of her in the snow. And it's uh, so that, that one will always be special to me. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, this one. Yeah, these. Oh. Wow. Oh. Oops. So this this one here will also always have a special place in my heart. Actually, yeah, all of these. This was uh, my friend uh, Kevin Lip, um, crisp image photography on Instagram. Um, he he had he had. Um, I learned a lot from him uh, just about like being out in nature and stuff because he'd always he'd lived in in British Columbia his whole life and he had always been like an outdoors person and uh, had much more experience than me and so he he had he knew where the great grays were and he'd, he'd he'd spent a lot of time finding them and then he was kind enough to bring me along and we spent a weekend uh you know away from everything far out in nature with no nobody else around really and we got to spend so much time with these great grays and that was the first time i i ever saw great gray owl and, and got to photograph Wow. photograph them spend time with them so that was always be a very very special experience to me um yeah we had the this is the exchange where the where the where the male comes in and, and delivers the bowl to the female so she can drop it off with the babies uh yeah it was, it was just they're just such amazing birds uh yeah this one too it's, i like this one whoops sitting there looking badass and that one too they're just amazing birds and it's they're so big it's crazy uh this is kind of a you know yeah. almost a cliche but <laughs> yeah exactly but i spent so much time trying to get this shot <laughs> just <laughs> trying to get exactly when he came in so uh, so to me it will always be a bit special um 
this is one of my favorite shots i think of a pygmy i just this guy just looks so awesome i think and i i, I like the uh the you know this was out in um this was also on the sunshine coast but pretty far away from everything it was uh like some old burnt logs and stuff from from uh like a, a forest fire and just had this guy sitting there and it was this was also with kevin and we we spent a couple of days looking and then we finally found the this, this guy and a uh, little pygmy owl and he he stayed around for a long time. It was just, it was just an amazing day. We spent, I think, three hours just photographing this little guy and rain and all kinds of different conditions. Uh, yeah, more shorties. Always interesting with the shorties. Uh, these guys are just amazing. I've, I shot some of them in Denmark too uh, this year, which which was fun. Very different behavior in Denmark. In, in British Columbia, they were out hunting all day. In Denmark, they they're only out just in the beginning, uh, just in uh, they're out at night, uh, and you only kind of get them at dawn and dusk. So I mean, it's it's that made me understand how amazing it is in BC that you can actually shoot them in daylight. And then these two shots here I also really like uh, personally. It was this was uh, where we lived in Gibson's on the Sunshine Coast. This was the hummingbird that was hanging out on the property we lived on there. So I was, I was shooting him from the <laughs> from the patio on the first floor, just right outside my 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 living room, and uh, I just I love the detail of the you know the droplets on the on the beak yeah. and on the on his head here, just incredible little birds. And also because they have they have basically their their legs are basically useless, like they can't use them to walk. They can only perch. They, so it's really hard for them to to bathe. So it's fun to see the little hummers out there once they, they get really excited about the rain because then they can they can have a little have a little shower. Uh, yeah, this one real quick. This was a pretty cool experience, also on the Sunshine Coast uh, with a coyote. That um, it just didn't see me, so I, I saw it on the beach way down. Uh, it was hunting. Or scavenging or whatever and I, I i i laid down real quick and i had the sun to my back and uh he just didn't see me so he just kept coming closer and closer and closer and closer and by the end i felt like i have to i have to move now just so that so the coyote knows i'm there otherwise it, you know it's going to get weird and uh, so it was it was incredible it was just so close it was one of the coolest experiences i've had with a mammal and i just it's just such a beautiful um beautiful um specimen too because you know with the eyes and everything it was just he was just a beautiful fellow yeah obviously the uh, the barred owls a lot of barred owls in british columbia and the babies are really fun uh yeah they're just so much fun the little guys s spend all day screaming screaming for food this was a, a bear in my backyard where we lived in gibson's uh, mama bear yeah that was the first time i had a bear and, and just like you know five yards from the house just on a property that was that was cool that was really really special like holy shit this is just this is <laughs> right outside my house <laughs> <laughs> the belted kingfishers will always be special to me because they were i became fascinated with them and they're just so difficult to photograph i think anyone you've, you've probably had experiences with them like they're just impossible to approach you know and they just if they if they in any way see or hear they just like they just scream and fly away so Getting these shots here, I spent so many days lying absolutely still on the ground, you know, uh, just waiting for them to come in and land. And that's also where the C6 would make a big difference with the silent shutter. So I could spend more time because with the DSLR, I basically had one shot, clack, ah, and the bird is gone. Uh, yeah, I love these guys. They're just such amazing birds. I really, I miss them a lot. They're really cool. Uh, fast forward to some stuff in Denmark. Uh, one of the subjects I really love here in Denmark are the uh, uh, the, the bearded tits or the bearded reedlings. Just such beautiful birds. The males here, they have that, well, I guess, mustache. To me, it looks more like a black tear, black teardrop. Just the really, really gorgeous birds. Um, they're, super, they're quite difficult to shoot because they spend most of their time kind of deep in the reeds. So some days you can just hear a hundred of them, but none of, the, none of them come out where you can shoot them. Uh, oh yeah, of course the European kingfisher. These guys are amazing. Just such beautiful birds. I love them. Um, the common kingfisher. 
And it was, it was kind of fun because they have more or less exactly the same uh, behavior as, as the Belta kingfishers in Canada, except these guys are just like, they're so small. Like the ones in Canada are like this, but these guys are just tiny. And I knew they were small, but once I saw them in real life, I was just, I was blown away by how small they are. Uh, yeah, the fox here, that was a, that was a pretty cool experience. The fox um, in, in winter that came in, I, I, this is one of my personal favorite shots. So I just, I've been dreaming of getting this shot. It's actually one of the few shots I've been dreaming of and where I got exactly kind of where I wanted after a lot of hard work, but that was a big, big one for me. Uh, I just showed just a couple more and then we'll be done. Um, yeah, this is some of the stuff I, I find more interesting now. I'm trying to do more small in frame, you know, early morning light and stuff like that. I, you know, just a little bit more in the artistic direction. I did have a cool uh, couple of weeks uh, I spent with uh, a family of uh, common kestrels, uh, four, four babies. And it was really, really fun just seeing how, how they, you know, over a couple of weeks following them, how they learn and develop, you know, uh, develop their instincts and everything. It was really fun. And the babies, um, I was really respectful and paid close attention to their behavior. But, you know, kestrels are so incredibly difficult uh, to approach. So it's just amazing with, with the babies here who, who weren't that shy yet and you know, they, they kind of, uh, they tolerated me, uh, you know, getting pretty close. So I was able to get some really cool behavior, which was, which was a lot of fun. I love the, like the detail of all that blood, blood on the beak. He's got the mouse here. And the, the, this one is not probably not everyone's, uh, taste, uh, you know, but I kind of like the detail of, of the tail out of the mouth. And one thing that was kind of fun is, what was that? That's beautiful. The one at the next one, uh, the one in the green, yeah. It was, it was, I was surprised at how much time these little guys spend on the ground. Uh, I, I had no idea. Like they spend a lot of time just hopping around uh, in the grass, just kind of, you know, hanging out and, and rolling around in the grass. I, 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 that was just completely new behavior to me. I had no idea. <laughs> and then I was able to get some of the more kind of creative shots also with them which was kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then this one is one of the, sh yeah, it's just rendering now. There we go. Got a bit of the breath there and stuff. So this is kind of what I've been trying to do more lately, get some backlit. I'm just become. I really want to get some nice shots with the breath in there, but um, it's difficult. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you. Oh, yeah. One macro shot here. A little bug. <laughs> the toughest part. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's an amazing collection. Thank you, thank you. Uh, there we go. Cool. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much. You know, for, especially the first part and uh, later on the second part, you match it along with your images, so we could really go through the journey of supporting and then getting into the images and relating it with each other that was really amazing and the point which you shared initially that makes a lot of sense because it's really taking you through that starting pace to the eventual progress you know that, that's yeah. very 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 relatable and it definitely do help a lot of people who is trying to pursue the same thing Excellent. Thank you. I'm so happy to hear that. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad it made sense. Uh, uh, all of it. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for the it's conference. actually a very helpful document for a beginner photographer. Go to yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. advanced level. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I think it's interesting to talk about, you know, some of the some of the different aspects. Uh, you know, it, there's a lot of gear talk, and there's a lot of settings talk and so on, I think often and a lot of just like kind of uh, uh, location specific, where should I go to shoot this? And I just, there's so much other stuff that's, that's so important, you know, to learn yeah. and talk about. And I think, I think some of the things I tried to touch on today are some of the things that are maybe, you know, less, uh, there's less focus on them, but they're so important. And I think, yeah, most photographers, 
people who really get into to wildlife photography and become obsessed, I think we're all going to go through <laughs> these different <laughs> these different phases at some point. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that that's where we could really relate, you know, we all have the same feeling, we start with this extreme close ups, the fascination for the longer lenses. But then we end up eventually, you know, from 400 to 600, then getting back to 400, yeah. 400 then 7200, then wide angle, then going macro. So this is something yeah. which every one of us go through in this journey. And, and, and it's amazing. It, it's really funny. And also you kind of have to, like I said a couple of times when I was going through it, like when, when people used to say this stuff, I'd be like, Psh. like, you know, <laughs> ah, that's, that's kind of arrogant or something like that was like, and then, a, you know, a year later, I'm like, ah, that was actually completely, <laughs> you know, they were just, they were just ahead of me. And, and I ended up there myself. So it's, it's kind of funny how, and like you said, it's funny how similar I think it is for a lot of photographers. It's, you know, once once you've spent a while doing it, and you, and you talk to other people, it's like there's, it's yeah, it's 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 funny how similar that journey ends up being for a lot of us. And you know, maybe maybe there's different, you know, uh, maybe there's different uh, subjects you focus on or, or different genres or something. But it's 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 interesting how similar the journey ends up being. I think. Yeah. yeah. But it, I think at the end of the day, it, we no matter which, uh, you know, we know uh, wildlife photographers who are doing macro and macro photographers who are doing birding. So we, but generally we all go through as the time passes in our, as we grow old in yeah. the first particular segment, we all feel the same in one or the other way. Yeah, yeah. But that's also what's so cool about, I think, especially wildlife photography is just, it's it's infinite you can you know it, it never gets boring because it's it's you can keep on going forever and you can you can keep on learning and you can keep on going to the back to the same place or you can you know you can try to shoot the same subject over and over again and, and try to get something new and something different so you're, you're constantly inventing you know reinventing yourself and, and finding new yeah. exciting ways of doing it I, I, to me that's just that's it's just absolutely fascinating and just yeah so much fun so frustrating also but also <laughs> it's, it's, it's very satisfying uh you know you, tor you torture yourself a lot there's a lot of uh, i guess masochism <laughs> involved with it <laughs> i agree yeah it's it's the same for us you know we ended up in both of us we started with birding then we ended up in africa initially seeing a lion was good or a or a leopard was good but then now it's like the lion should be in this particular light and the yes. lion should do this. The lion <laughs> should come out of a den. The lion should have the frills around his head. I, I, yeah. your, your, your imagination go wild and you will be waiting for those kind of moments and you will be praying meditation or asking nature or, you know. What yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, 100%. So, yeah. And another thing I find fascinating also is that... Um, it's interesting with different species that are common or not common where you live. So, for example, when I moved to British Columbia, the first time I saw a bald eagle, it's just like, I'm looking at a bald <laughs> eagle. I can't believe it. You know, it doesn't get better. And then like two years later, I was like, that's 14 <laughs> bald eagles. In the tree. Like, I don't care. You know, and then, uh, for example, in Denmark, you're moving to Denmark. That was you know, part of the exciting thing here was uh, there's a lot of new species for me here. So some of the birds that are completely common for Danish photographers or, or birders, they're like, Psst. like, you know, uh, 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 Eurasian jay, like, Psst. they're everywhere. And to me, it's like, oh, <laughs> like, it's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's funny with that, too, I think. Yeah, even, even we, uh, when we do workshops, a lot of people used to come with us uh, regularly. For example, to Masemara. So each time they come, I do notice that their requirements get <laughs> bigger and bigger. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, the first time when they come, they ask for a just a lion portrait, then go for a hunt, then a lot of things you will get. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, they become more demanding. <laughs> come and asking for, you know, this was the craziest uh, requirement I ever had. Uh, lion mating in front of a rainbow and the funniest part I never thought that is going to happen but it did happen 
I, oh God, sometimes it is unbelievable. This guy had only one imagination, <laughs> lion mating in front of a rainbow. And I was, I, I didn't know what to tell him. First of all, getting a subject in front of rainbow itself is amazing. And oh, yeah. his dream was lion mating, specifically lion mating in front of rainbow. And we got it on our third day, which was unbelievable even now. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, that's insane. I can't believe that that happened. You must have been like, I keep, you were, they, 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 must have thought you were, they must have thought you were the best guide ever in, in, in the entire history of the planet. Like, they're amazing. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they made a rainbow up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very cool. <laughs> that was that was an, an unbelievable thing for us but yeah that is nature i think you know the more we feel it we have that inner passion i think that definitely get into manifestation mode quite often when it comes to nature yeah it is interesting and i think also that's i i, I you know, getting philosophical or whatever. I think I I have learned some important life lessons through uh, wildlife photography. Definitely, the whole thing about being patient and trying to accept, uh, you know, the things that I can't that I can't control. You know, yeah. just trying to. I've I've definitely become more patient also with other aspects of life and just become better at accepting that there are some things I can't control even if I want to, and I just kind of have to try and let it go and kind of, you know, go with the flow. And then I think also the aspect of, of kind of discipline or, you know, in the sense that, uh, you know, with a lot of this, you just have to keep trying, like you said, you know, yeah. keep going back, keep going back, keep going back. And then maybe you have to go there 20 times. And then, you know, when you, the 20 first time you go there, then you get it. But also that's so rewarding, I think, and that, I think that's part of it. Also, is the whole, is the yeah the, the 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 torture part of it, you know, that you're like you get so frustrated, you know, and, and you want to give up, and then finally it happens, and you're just like, oh man, it was worse, it was worse, worth all of it. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's true. No, we have come across the photo of, photo of a kingfisher. Somebody tried almost. 600,000 shots to get one particular yeah. moment. That story yeah. was amazing. Then there was another fellow from Norway who waited for a particular um, a shot of um, uh, red fox, or I don't remember which, mm -hmm. or after fox, uh, in front of a uh, full moon on top oh. of a mountain. And we, we that was a cover shot for our magazine once. And he said he waited for that for 12 years, going on every Jesus. full moon day uh, to see the possibility. And he managed to get it in one day. That is amazing, right? So <laughs> that's yeah, amazing. Yeah. That is absolutely incredible. Yeah. Wow, 12 years. Yeah. And then also, I saw, I, I saw someone share something different where it was like somebody made a video or something like, you need a lot of uh, patience in wildlife photography. I waited two hours for this or that. I waited three hours for that. <laughs> and people were writing, oh, that's amazing. People aren't photographers. That's amazing. That's incredible. I was like, three hours? Oh, you're lucky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. There are shots we are still looking for since years. I mean, me and Hermi started to going to Africa from, I think, almost 11 years now. I'm still looking for a lion shaking his head in after a rain. In the, I mean, we have seen it many times, got some lovely shots as well. But then you have certain things in your head. Yes. You really want, every time you get something is missing here or there, or it may be our greediness or our high expectation, which is changing according to time, as you mentioned. But then that is the, that is we humans. And that's the expectation part again. But I think that's amazing. I think that's the amazing part of it is, you know, it's, oh, it's just, you know, you keep on working for that perfect thing. And I, I guess that's maybe part of it also is kind of, I think there's a, maybe a fascination with capturing that perfect moment. You know, I think there's, there's some kind of, I don't know. I think, I think most artists are, are, it, it sounds dramatic, but are, are in some ways broken inside, you know? So <laughs> I think a lot of us are, are trying to find that perfect moment because then it somehow fixes things that are wrong or something because like this is perfect. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're in pursuit of, of, of capturing that moment where you're going to go, there you go, you know? And I so there's, can, there's a I lot of times I'll, 
Yeah, I'll show my, my wife the photo. And she'll be like, that's amazing, Michael. You finally got it. I'm like, no, because you see the stick? <laughs> no, I, I didn't see the stick. I'm sorry, I did. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Nice talking to you, Michael. Yeah, you too. I'm so okay. happy you, uh, you it was asked a great me. Great session. Yeah, it was, it was so much fun and, and it was so <laughs> wonderful meeting you too. You're really, really lovely people. So I'm, I'm so happy Same, we got yeah. to talk. Thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate we'll, you too. Yeah, we'll, it, was, it was great. <laughs> we'll meet uh, soon. Hopefully. I hope so. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> oh, that would be great. That would be great. Yeah, let me know if uh, if there's anything, uh, yeah, anything you can uh, use yeah, me for sure. or whatever. If there's anything you want to talk about or anything, that would be, uh, that would be amazing. Sure, sure. And, uh, yeah, maybe I can. Uh, maybe I'll uh, I'll book uh, a tour with you one day. That would uh, I've, I ha I haven't been to Masamara, so that's definitely. Oh, you should. I'm Get sure it. you will fall in love with. It. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the dangerous part. <laughs> <laughs> Ask us. We started with that, once. A year, and now yeah, right. This that, is that's a dangerous yeah. part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, amazing! Great. Well, thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Okay, thank then. You. Thank you. See you soon. See you. Bye. 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 So that was Michael and that was his experience and it was really an amazing journey. We really could feel our journey through his, yes. you know, ups and downs. A lot and of points we could learn from him. Yes. Yeah. So who is next? Tell me you have any idea, any dates or something my, in the future. My problem is I am not able to talk properly because I had a dental surgery. So <laughs> that's why if I laugh, <laughs> I get relax. start pain. <laughs> relax, relax. No worries. Yeah. So well, yeah, I as I mentioned last session. week, last week, and as I mentioned, Hermi had a small surgery. He's still recovering. So bear with his silence. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we and have he's... a session on Friday uh, mm -hmm. with the, our dearest Vinky. Okay. Yeah. So he's sharing his experience on his first uh, Masema trip with us. Okay. So Vinky is yeah, doing so by himself or? Uh, Vinky is a... doing by himself. Okay. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. It's, so it's when are you Friday. traveling to make me jealous? I'm traveling Saturday night. I'll be there only 40 days. <laughs> I'll kill you, man. <laughs> so any of you are interested in joining us or joining Hermi, or even if you want to do it by yourself in Masai Mara in any time uh, nearby or future, I think future is the better way after any time in December, January, February, any month, do get in touch with us. We have a beautiful place in Masai Mara right now. We beautiful have a camp. house. Beautiful house, yes. <laughs> we have a camp there. Uh, uh, the place is called the Mara Trails. And the, it's more than a particular place, place. You know, uh, it's, a, it's all about supporting the community and support what we believe in. So the 50% of our profit is going completely on conservation and to support uh, the locals support the community so we really appreciate your support and at the website you can check our details from mara trails that's the name of the camp so do join us at mara trails if you are planning anything for masai mara yeah so let's find up today's session yeah okay then thank you everyone yeah. for watching Take care and bye-bye. Bye-bye.